Imagine for a moment, you're growing up, you go to high school, you're making mistakes, but you don't really know that you're making mistakes. You don't really like your family. And you move on and you start to do all kinds of different jobs. You become a lifeguard, a ski instructor. Maybe you get a job as a construction worker. And you have a terrible accident where you almost die. And you have a near-death experience. And then you go to Medjugorje with your mother. And you have an experience there that transforms your life. The message today from Father Rick to all of us, you never know when God is going to call you. Please welcome Father Rick Wendell. Good morning, everyone. My mother at 86 and a half, when halves count, decided she was going to go to the Lord Monday just before midnight. I loved my mother dearly. I'm her firstborn son. There's so much to that. My first child that quickens in the womb, image of the mother with her hands on her belly, the way that she refused to let my father name me Michael, so everyone calls me Michael anyway. Um, <laughs> Family was very important to her, and she was always that image of love in our household and of faith as well as many women are. The good news was I went to go see my mama, and she was laying there comfortably and not conscious. More than any other day, I just kept kissing her and telling her, gosh, you know, man, you're a great mom. I love you to death, you know, literally. And... And, and as I did, and then I started, I raised my hands to heaven, and I, was, I started thanking God. Thank you for my mom. Thank you for her life. Thank you for her giving me life. Thank you for the way she prayed me out of hell. Thank you, Lord God, for every grace and blessing. But, Lord, it's time. There's nothing more to be done. Please, come and take my mother quietly and peacefully. And I talked to the nurses and asked for that medication. It'll clear that up a little bit, make it easier to breathe. And I went to my car, and I got in there, and it was 2.59. I, did, I had to be taught, too, right? Three o'clock, the hour of mercy. And I started driving away, and I said, Lord Jesus, you gave me your mother from the cross. I'm giving you my mother back. Please, come and take her. Take her back to yourself, peacefully and quietly. I got the phone call at 12.15 in the morning that when they went in to check with her at 11.45, she was with the Lord. Thank you, Lord. A great grace of God. And... I just came back from the 8th to the 18th from a pilgrimage to Medjugorje, as, again, but the first time alone since I went there 25 years ago, and it changed my life. I've come back renewed again, refreshed, revitalized, because the Blessed Mother called me to this little village in the former Yugoslavia, Bosnia now, and it's not been approved. Whatever the church says, I will follow. I know, like the thousands of other priests who mark their vocations of coming from there, that the grace of God is abundant there, period, and a statement. So, um, you know, I started off life in January of 1960. I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but it was very Catholic. So we were culturally and faithfully Catholic family. We said grace before meals. We, my mama, you know, led us in prayers at bedtime. We went to Mass every Sunday without fail. You know, we are also the home of the Green Bay Packers, so St. Vin, St. Vince Lombardi. <laughs> Catholic guy, went to Mass every day, actually thought he might be a priest. Yes, St. Vince Lombardi. You know, faith, family, football, right? <laughs> And so I excelled at, at just about everything I did, right? I, I was an academic, uh, you know, scholar. I was, a, I was really good in sports. I, I am an Eagle Scout. 
I, you bought all those things. But I, I, of course, when I was 16, in my Boy Scout uniform with the merit badge, the police officer, I stopped uh, later at my parents, um, and he finally caught up with me, jumped out with his gun, pointed it at me, put your hands on the roof, you. <laughs> I didn't know how to drive a car unless it was going full blast. <laughs> and uh, a lot of my friends died because of that stuff. We took lots of challenges. Um, and I, on the motorcycle, my parents forbade me to have, as soon as I got out of the house at 18, had a motorcycle, didn't take me but a few months to crash it so bad, I spent eight hours in surgery. And, and it was so miraculous in the way, because no one could recreate the accident where I, I couldn't die, um, said, God's saving you for something special. I'm like, whatever, you know, because I'm lucky. I went to Catholic University, not the one, in, you know, uh, but, but St. John's in Collegeville, Minnesota, and no one went to church. You know, and the monks weren't really saying their prayers in public so you could see it. And so we just became like every other college kid and every other indulgence that you do. And eventually I, I found my way to um, Little Cottonwood Canyon, Utah, uh, the steep in the deep where it snows uh, a minimum of 150 uh, days a year, or a minimum of 450 inches a year. And at that time, I was skiing 150 days a year. Uh, you know, in your early 20s, doing things that there's no way you could do later in life. And there was a lot of risk taking in place and things that, you know, very close to death on numerous occasions. Um, I have had 13 major orthopedic surgeries, uh, three on this wrist, three on this wrist, five on that knee, one on that knee, plus a myriad of other things where yeah, I'm suffering for it now. <laughs> well, along that way, I found in the summertime where I'd been a professional lifeguard before was that I, and between the end of the beach season and the beginning of skiing, there was a shoulder there. And so I was building these, you know, exotic condominiums with copper roofs up at the, the Avalanche Road um, between Snowbird and Alta. And, you know, you got to be half monkey and all that kind of stuff. To, and you're, so I found that I could make more money doing that and still get a suntan in the summer. So I started building. And then, so by 27, um, I, I stopped doing all of that. And I was doing construction full time. And I had 15 men working for me. And I found that my edge was in the, the very high end executive and uh, golf course homes. And um, I became one of today's people. I had multiple cars and wardrobes of clothes I can't wear and you know I, I had a at the end I had a 40-foot motor yacht in front of the house and could sleep six on beds and two bathrooms you know. I mean if you're gonna go, go large, right? <laughs> and my ego was just that large. I, I don't know if what I was doing could have backed it up but I had this huge ego Rolled into a bar one night. There was a girl a year older than me in high school. Of course, the girls older than you don't look at you, right? Until you're 10 years later, and you're going to date me. And we like the same stuff on pizza, right? So, so I got engaged in a big, splashy way, and we were, I went through marriage prep. So, yes, Father, I'll tell you anything you want. I just want to have the cathedral that Saturday, you know? Right? I mean, they do it to me today. Father, we don't have any relationship with the church, but Grandma did. Can we use it? No. <laughs> Not unless you want to go through my marriage prep, and that's going to be a bit rugged for you. Because I want to be sex successful in marriage, right? Not just in a relationship. So, um, in the process of this, January, or June 22nd of 1990, um, I, was, uh, I was building this retaining wall system and got hit by one of the fastening devices, big nail, cut me, and I had to go to the hospital, go get some stitches like a million times before. My mom lived with me and had had a heart attack because my father had served her divorce papers after 30 years of marriage. 
So, so it wasn't that I was the good son, but I was the son. We had that relationship. So I had her drive me to the hospital, and I got stitched up. And on the way back, she just let me stop at the grocery store to get something, you know. Well, Mom, don't shop, right? Because women can go someplace and shop and never buy anything. <laughs> or when they get home, they tell you how much money they saved. <laughs> you know, guys are like, that's where, the, you know, that's the department. I'm going to it, and I'm buying those four tires, and that's what it is, you know. It's, it's more like hunting. <laughs> so... I, so I'm gonna kind of control her by sitting in the car and my heart started to race. And so I turned on the car because I thought maybe it's a heat thing. And it wouldn't quit and I couldn't change anything. So I got out of the car lest they find me in the car. And I went in the door and, I, and as it opened, you know those automatic doors, I grabbed the, the bus boy and, and I said, you're gonna have to do CPR and I went to the ground and I was out. My mom was there. And she, she'd gone to medical school. Um, she, she ran the laboratory for the, um, that hospital, and then later after she recovered from the heart attack for the state prison system. And, and she, she just started barking orders. The, the ambulance crew was out of the parking lot, down a half a block, up a half a block at the fire barn. So they were there like, bam. And she just, you don't even assess him, ship him. So they flapped me on the gurney, put me in the ambulance, and left. My mother knew something was wrong because she beat the ambulance to the hospital. <laughs> and and they, they, the reason why is because I had coded, I had stopped, my heart had stopped um, before they ever got out of the parking lot. So they shocked me three times with the paddles, could not get me going, so they were doing manual closed chest heart massage. They were, they were, and I was unconscious enough to intubate me already. They were breathing for me. They, they took me up into the hospital, and they started to work on me furiously, and I'm what's called a witness to rest. They, they saw my heart attack, and, you know, I was 30 years old. I was buff, you know, and... And there's a really good possibility you can, you can resuscitate somebody like that. They just couldn't seem to do it. And, and, and the people that were supposed to end the shift never left. And the new shift came on, and they were taking turns doing chest compressions because they didn't have, the, some people call it a thumper, but it's a machine that'll do the compressions for you. And, and then they were, you know, oxygen assist bagging me, you know, breathing for me. And Ernie, the respiratory tech, stayed the whole time. And they kept doing circles, and, and then they had, you know, I got the IVs in there, they're trying everything they can, but they, they can't get me going, and, you know, my blood pH from the lab was showing that not only was I, you know, that where they normally stop the life-saving procedures, but I was actually 6.4, I was in acidosis, which meant I was probably brain dead. And um, I had a donor card on file, which is a good way for you to like, have people be more interested in saving you. So I, I advocate owner donation, if, if only for the hope that you'll remain with us, but if not, somebody else may live. Um, so I remember, the, I remember the, the kid with the dark hair, and then my next thing if, was, was that I was, I was looking up, and this guy was over the top of me, and he was just leaning on me, and I couldn't feel it. And I was like, well, that's strange. And, and then there was these IV bags hanging and swinging, and there was a wood green cabinetry, and it must have been the inside of the ambulance. And this conversation was going on, but somehow I wasn't paying attention to it or didn't hear it but I could see everything behind me at the same time, like a panoramic vision, undistorted, like I could see everything. But some people talk about being above, I wasn't above it, I was looking, like, and then I went through the picture. You know, like through a three-dimensional image like we have here of, you know, vision, what, and I'm through the other side and it's just black, nothing. And I wasn't excited about that fact or scared or, lonely or, you know, anything, I was just kind of, oh, you know, I'm observing it. And then there's light. But this is where all the stuff breaks down because you can't talk about it in terms, you know, that's a candlelight. 
That's an incandescent bulb. That's sunlight. You know, it's a red in that exit sign. Blue, green, you know. Women are great at, you know, guys are like light purple, and dark purple. Well, it's magenta, you know. Um, that, that all of that stuff doesn't, it doesn't, and distance doesn't make, it's not distance. And, and it was just this piercing light, pure light, but it was soft too. It was like, and then it, you, I guess for me, you could say it looked like a tunnel, but it was more like it just spread out. And, and I don't know, didn't know whether I was going toward it or it was coming toward me. I, I couldn't tell. And then all of a sudden I'm in the presence of this light and I know things. Like, without thinking about it? Like, before you even thought about it? I mean, I know there's God. I mean, I know it. I don't believe it. I didn't think about it and arrive at it. I know it. I mean, what could be more obvious? And, and that I wasn't God, you know, I wasn't God. But that, that... All of this is within God. There's nothing that's outside of God. Even our understanding of hell is not outside of God. It's just, we got our back to it. We don't want it. That, that all, everything in here, everything has to correspond to laws. And God set those laws. They're, they're immutable as he's immutable. But he doesn't have to do it because he made it, right? He can do whatever he wants with it. We're not nameless beings that have no purpose or we're accidental in it. What we do with our life is important. It's really important. And it affects everyone else around us. You know that pebble in the pond imagery, right? So just for time, part of it, is, is that I, I, my mama loved me, right? I know she loved me. You know, my dad just didn't know how to tell me he loved me, but somehow deep down inside I knew that. Um, I'd fallen in love. You know, I'd won the big game. I'd done all that kind of, you know, I mean, I had experienced love but not like this. I mean, this love was so overwhelming, so passionate, so incredible, majestic, um, fulfilling, that I didn't even think of anything else. All I wanted to do was be loved. That's all I wanted. I just wanted to be loved. And I didn't know you could be loved like that, and it was so absolutely incredible and ecstatic and whatever words you, that fail to describe, you know, what you have always longed for, you know. And, you know, time doesn't really exist. Not as, we, we do it, we use it to understand the things that we encounter in this life that are real in, in that way, right? So that, you know, we, we have the way our Earth orbits the sun or the sun orbits us, who gives a, right? We, there, but there's a definite pattern to that. And we can set, set something to that and um, have our watch, but it's, you know, two hours later here than it is in the central time zone where I live. And we experience that difference in the, solar part of it we you know we know when there's you know in the tilt of the earth those moments when it's the summer solstice right it's the you know all those kinds of events and you can build and put rocks in a line that day you know and everybody thinks oh extraterrestrials must have thought that you know that the, the lunar cycle right the the full moon right, for three days, and when you don't have um, street lights, you can walk around in the dark and not trip, so that's when you hold your festivals during the full moon, 
It's not extraterrestrial, it's just terrestrial. And, and that, you know, the fact that the moon has on the tides, right? That's a real thing that happens. Every 28 days, half the women in this room know exactly that it's been 28 days. Men, I didn't have any sisters. You can forget about such things when you're a priest unless you get reminded. But, the, but this, you know, that we all are part of this and there's a reality to this, right? But that your perception of time will change when you're a little kid, right? Whole life adventures can happen at recess. <laughs> Especially if you have a bully waiting for you. It's an eternity. Okay? And it could be, you know, I only imagine this, but I think, you know, it must be an eternity every moment in childbirth until the child comes out all forgotten. Oh, it's my baby, right? And everything changes. The slow motion of the accidents that I've been into. And then they speed back up to regular speed. That our perception of time changes over time, you know, in our physical natures, but that everyone else is experiencing it at a different thing. It's just our way of plugging in, if you will, okay? But that as a thing, it doesn't exist, and therefore God, who is outside of time, is not affected by that. He made that. And there... St. Thomas Aquinas, I learned later in the seminary, years later, calls this kind of knowledge infused knowledge. It's, it's, it just comes from God and goes directly to you. It's before thought. It's before language. It's before communication. It's before any of that. It's given to you. And I was perfectly content where I was. And then I felt like I was falling. And I kept reaching for the light because I didn't want to go. Well, I went, I, I, I was, you know, unresponsive. I was on the gurney, right? They're working on me. My eyes don't react to light. The pupils are not yet dilated, but they won't react to light. I won't react to any pain stimuli. It's called coma stimuli. Make pain, see if you react. You know, um, every indication was is that I was dead clinically, right? brain dead and they were just trying to get this body stabilized so they could ship me and use my organs. I'm AB positive blood, only about 2% of the population, AB neg is the most rare, AB po therefore I am very valuable in parts. <laughs> right? And it said that AB positive, when they're typing it, that, that on the various uh, examples of Jesus' blood that it appears that they're all A-B positive. Now, that doesn't make me Jesus. <laughs> just makes my configuration to Christ as a priest just a little closer, I hope, <laughs> through his precious blood. So, in any way, I, so I'm totally unresponsive. My family has gathered... Um, my fiance's mom drove her, and my dad waited until work was done because his son was always in the hospital, and he always pulls through. <laughs> so they, when he came in, they said, put down your flowers and that greeting card and go say goodbye. He told me later that when he touched me, I was cool to his touch. So my mother drug my fiance in there, and while they're working on me, this is after several hours now, they were like yelling at me going, you are loved and you cannot leave. And the ambulance crew was still waiting there and, and, uh, and my mother begged for my life, you know. She said, Lord, if you need him, then take him. But if you give him back to me, give him back to me whole, or don't give it to me at all, because they wouldn't show my mom the lab reports and she knew exactly what was going on. So out of nowhere, my arm comes up and wraps around him. And the doctors, nurses, respiratory, lab, everybody from that crew has talked to me at some time or another, because there's just no way this is going to happen. Those of you who work in healthcare, you see it on both sides, right? Those who die and you can't figure out why. 
And then there are those that recover when recovery isn't an option. So they, and I kept forcibly trying to get up. So they had to tie me down lest I pull out all the leads, all the hoses and wires, and right? And quickly, I, I was stabilized. They shipped me to another hospital. By the time my parents caught up with me, I was sitting up in the ICU and talking. What I experienced was I felt like falling, and then I felt like I couldn't breathe properly. And I kept trying to breathe, and they, I heard these people go, don't fight, don't fight, breathe through your nose. Well, I was already in another hospital that had a nasal cannula in, but I was still intubated. So they pulled out the tracheal tube, and I told everybody that I died. So my mother comes in, and she goes, are you in there? <laughs> it's her story. And I said, yes, Mom, but I died. I died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. I was 30 years old, and my base trade was a carpenter. And I knew nothing about the divine mercy. I knew nothing about Sister Faustina. I knew nothing about it because I wasn't going to church. And I was worshiping in the halls of, you know, sexual liberation, um, libation, and money. None of my family was going to church. There was nobody in the background praying for me except probably some lonely nuns in front of the Blessed Sacrament at 3 o'clock begging for souls. Because somebody was praying for me somewhere, somehow, someplace. Just like there is somebody, there is a priest somewhere on this earth every minute of every day offering Jesus Christ in the Mass. Every moment of the day. The sun will never go down on the mass being held somewhere. Think about it. So, the next day, they're running me through all these tests, can't find anything wrong with me. People are like, you better, you better like learn some relaxation skills. <laughs> my, uh, my, uh, uh, my proposed wife, right, had a half brother, was a Lutheran missionary, and they put on, a, they had generated a computer generated banner, which I still have, it says get well soon, and they asked God for something, they put Psalms 25, 4 through 6. Teach me your ways, O Lord, make your paths known to me, for you are the God who saved me. Remember not the sins of my youth. Now, I didn't know where Psalms was in the Bible because I was a good practicing Catholic. Father will tell me just before he reads it. Well, he led me through the Bible, all Old Testament. And this is a New Testament phrase, but it covers it. This sickness was not unto death, but unto life, and that happened for a reason. And there was a presence in the room, and I knew it. And the first thing that I did is I picked up the scriptures, and I opened and read that, and then all of it was about how... Israel, Ish meaning God, El meaning, I mean, Ish meaning man, El meaning God, right? Israel, man's relationship with God, man who turns to God, right? It's not a na just a nation state, it's us, okay? So that I had been banished from my inheritance, which I understood to be spiritual, and now I was going to be restored. And then the voice, stand up. You do not not do what he who is command says. I got up. Everything that's coming out of my mouth is praise to God. I go to the bathroom because I'm crying so hard. The snot is getting in the way of my mouth. I got a short sleeve deal on. I can't sleeve it. You know, I got to go get something. I go into the bathroom. The theme switches again for this grace. Mercy, right? This is what you have done with your life. Now give me your life. On your knees. I'm trying to get a hold of it. Get a hold of yourself. 
you know, every detail of the room. I kneel before the mirror in there and I'm doing this reality check, you know, make sure that I'm not, you know, if there's trauma to the body, does it release some traumatic chemicals to the brain and I'm experiencing a psychotic moment. And then the voice. You know exactly what's going on. And I just went, okay. I surrendered to the will of God. Give me your life. I leave the hospital and it's the next day and everything is different. And yet I'm the same. Right? None of this is an accident. It's all an intentionality by God. That, that we're not just a bunch of cosmic dust that fell together. Oh, yes, I have a very large uh, and checkered uh, science background. Send me your intellectual ones, and we'll see what they feel like when they leave. Because all of this points to one thing. It points right here. And that's why it should be in a church this way, right? And I flip open the scriptures, and it goes right to John 10.30. Now, I didn't know, right? So yesterday was, all, or Sunday was all Old Testament. Now this is all New Testament, only in the Gospel of John. First thing, Jesus meets Martha on the road as he's come to help them grieve the loss of his friend, Lazarus. Lazarus is not just three days in the grave because that was the death watch, three days you watch because some people recovered, you know, they had a illness or whatever, and you know how people do recover even though they look like they're dead. So how many days was he in the tomb? And what did he smell like? Not so good, right? He stinketh, to be sure, so that we could see the sign in, it, in his power. And Martha comes up to him and says, you know, if you would have come, my brother would have never died. And he says to her, can you remember, right? A man, even though he be dead, yet shall he live. A person who lives will never die. Do you believe this? It was, this is where scripture is ours in the moment and is, it is living and alive as God who penned it. Rick Wendell, do you believe this? Dead man, do you believe this? Yes, Lord, I do believe it. Flips through there, all in order. Okay. You know the Father? Yep, met him Sunday. Yep. The Father and I are one. And if you don't understand that, understand it by the works. Saturday, Monday. You know what's going on. You've heard my voice before. And everyone that has come before you has been a liar and a thief. I am the gatefold. No one gets to the Father you met on Sunday except through me. I know my sheep and they know me. I am the good shepherd. Okay, I, I get it. I, I have heard your voice before. I didn't listen to it. So, now I go to make a place for you in heaven. And where I am, yet shall ye be. I have a promised place in heaven. I have been restored from my banishment, from my destruction due to sin, to death, not only of my physical body, but of my soul. Fear not him who can kill the body, fear him who can kill the soul. And now is being restored, right? The promises that are each one of ours, that God has set before us in scripture and in truth and in history to be reminded through every single prophet and every single person who comes to tell us the good news of Jesus Christ. And that truth is permanent. And it happened not just in time, but in eternity. That's why it works for everybody who came before him and everybody who comes after us. Please, God. 
And when we get to heaven, we will see him. He will have a body just like ours, our resurrected body, and his will look the same, except he's going to have five details that we don't have. What are they? Right? I'm like, this really is God's word. God speaks to people who aren't holy and not ordained and not worthy of it one bit. God will speak to us and he will speak to us in our hearts. He will speak to us in his word. He will speak to us through other people. He will speak to us in ways that if we but listen, that still small voice within yourself, and it isn't your voice talking back to you and it isn't your conscience, it's a much deeper thing that resonates with us because we were created to be in relationship with God and we can hear it. What do I do now? I know that Scripture really is God's word, that he does speak to people, that Jesus is who he said he was and is the Christ. But I don't know if being Catholic means anything in that regard, you know, so that's just Because that's just how I was raised. I don't know if that's the right way or better way or nothing. And these people, they seem to know him. I start on this journey, and I would go to the church. I, I go to confession, and you think this priest is going to be so scandalized. No. Yeah, I understand. I get it. I'm here to help you. This wonderful gift that he gives us in the confessional. I mean, I went there, told this priest all this stuff, and he's going, say five Hail Marys. And I'm like, dude, five Hail Marys wouldn't even touch the first nasty thought I had in my head this morning. <laughs> and it wasn't his fault or anything like that. It was just how I felt. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to church on Sunday. There was mass during the week, and I would go once in a while. I liked it. And then along the way, my fiance's mother gave me this little thin book on, this, on the apparitions in Medjugorje the first five days. But we don't have to believe anything that's, that's uh, private revelation. Fatima, Lourdes, um, uh, Our Lady Guadalupe, you know, pretty obvious, approved by the church, but you don't have to believe them. You just got to believe in that guy. That is the fullest revelation of God, Jesus Christ. And we will never be, throughout all eternity, ever get to the depths of what that means. So I read this book. I'd heard about Fatima when I was a kid or whatever, and Lourdes and Bernadette and the healing waters. And, think, you know, I've, I've seen Guadalupe. I've been to most of these, you know, uh, Marian sites around the world, and uh, and I read this book, and I like I believed it. I thought, wow, if something this powerful of God is going on in the world, I'd like to see it. My dad's name was Thomas, my younger brother's name is Thomas, but I'm Thomas. I want to put my fingers in the wounds, don't you? Just for reliability's sake. I made plans for a three-week-long pilgrimage to Rome, and then we'll go to this Medjahuchi place, because no one can ever pronounce it properly, <laughs> and we'll go, to, we'll go to Paris. I made these ridiculous plans, and my fiancé wouldn't go, and I said, Mom, there's two tickets, tickets to Zurich, and she goes, I'll go with you. So we went, and it was unbelievable. Saw everything. But the war was going to start in Bosnia. And my preferred method was to go over on a ferry from Italy over to Yugoslavia. At the War Department, or that War Department, the, the uh, State Department said, don't travel there, right? It's dangerous. This was the last ferry, and then they were going to come back to Italy, and they weren't going back over there again. So I said, we'll go someplace else, right? And the priest sponsoring us, head of the order goes, why let your faith fail you now? I'm thinking, what do you mean faith? This is called prudence. 
You know, you don't take your, you know, 60-year-old mother into a communist country that's at war with no way out, especially when I'm carrying all the bags. <laughs> so we go and we do it. I make one-way tickets. I mean, it's ridiculous. Then we're sitting down there with a bottle of Italian wine and some Italian crusty bread and some other things we had, but they had a little thing, so we had a, a dish of fried calamari. Oh, it was good. <laughs> and and we're, we're just saying, wow, man, look at this first week we had. We've got two more weeks to go. This is great. And this couple comes up with the maiden sister, the De Santos from San Diego. I will find them someday, right? They come up and they sit down and they go, they introduce themselves and talk and who are you and blah, blah, blah. And they said, uh, you know, the Lord uh, told us that we were to drive you to Medjugorje. What? what? Yes, we've been there many times. Our daughter works for the airline, so we fly for free. And um, we were praying and the Lord said that we were to drive this man and we would know when we see him and you're him. Okay. We get so it's overnight ferry. We get off in the morning. We go pick up some flowers. They take us to and they get this big car. I don't even know the manufacturer, but back then there was no guardrail. So you'd like these huge thousand foot plunges, right? Up these mountain roads and like you better have faith in God about that time, because you know, somewhere between the bottom and the top, you better go, I'm sorry for my sins, Lord. So they take us, they get right to the edge of town, and there's a street sign there, Medjugorje or Chitluk, and I, and I had this panic attack, and I've never had one before or since, that I would have jumped out of the car and left if it wasn't for my mother being in there and my luggage in the trunk. And I really believe it was the last chance the devil, he knew something was going to go on, and he was just trying to get me to not do it. So they take us to, to a house, and I'm like, but... The church is over there. That's where the action is. And, and my mother does that. Now, son, if you want to move tomorrow, we'll move. Today, I suggest you let the Lord have his way. Oh. So he take us to the church. We went in the church, and we left our flowers there. And then we went to this, this, this big elevation. I don't know how much it goes, you know, a 1,000 foot or more up. And in 1933, after a bunch of crop failures, they asked the priest what they should do to seek reparation with God so they wouldn't have their crops fail. So they made the way of the cross going up, and they built this big, huge cement cross, 1933, the 1900th anniversary after the death of Jesus, right? So and they named that the Hill of the Cross. Then there was this other place where the apparitions first began in 81, Mount Prado, the Hill of the Apparitions. So we went up to this thing, got about three, four stations up, this, the biggest elevation, and my mother said, would you just go on? I'm just not feeling up to it. Oh, Mom, I'll carry you. And at the time, I could. Would you just go on, son? I go up to the top. I have this prayer about how we had, we had profoundly screwed up a very simple plan of God, uh, of family life and prayer, and that he would provide everything that we needed, but we just... Got it, made it way too complicated and way too hard and way too unfulfilling and all that kind of stuff. And in fact, he was still loving us, but there was this coldness that we were returning to him, which wasn't even hatred because you got to care about something to hate. It was indifference. You know, don't you see that? It's just indifference to God. And, and I came back down. I couldn't find my mom. And there was a little cement, you know, store there, just one at that point. And my mom was having a... Uh, Czechoslovakian Budweiser, a Budvar. And uh, she was happily sitting there and she said, son, I, I, I didn't want you to know how bad I was feeling, you know, because of my heart and all that. But I, and I really wanted you to go, but you were taken so long. And I didn't feel like I could get down alone, so I asked the Lord to help me get down because I didn't think I could get down alone. And wouldn't you know it, he showed me where the stairs are. Did you take the path or the stairs? There ain't no stairs. And there's been prodigious miracles that, that have been received there. So we eat dinner, and then for an hour before Mass, they pray the rosary. And then it was during that hour that the apparitions began, and they would play a little um, 
set of bells. And then there was the mass uh, in the evening, the, the international mass for everyone. So I'm sitting on the sunny side of the church outside because it's packed. Like you cannot get in like packed up against the doors. For those of you who know the general admission rock concerts, right, packed like you can't push or elbow your way anywhere, you're there, and all the way up on the stairs and everything. And, uh, and, and it, was, it was a little cool outside, it was spring so I had a, a light jacket on, and I was just catching the solar, and uh, they are praying a rosary, and it was answering in 100 different languages, and then, and then I was like, and then there's people in robes. You can tell the difference between Koreans and Japanese and Filipinos. You can. <laughs> right? And you can tell Italians because they will climb mountains in loafers. <laughs> and Americans will wear tennis shoes to anything, no matter how inappropriate it might be. <laughs> and I got the universal church thing. Right? Catholic small sea. And to, from this little one horse, one paved road town, this message was going out to the world and it was all the same that everybody had ever said, right? T convert, turn back to God, right? Pray, fast, go to confession, eat the holy body and blood of Christ, and pray for peace. Nothing out of it's separate from the teaching of the church whatsoever. All it's doing is backing it up really simply. That's what Our Lady does in Fatima, right? He shows up in, uh, you know, having a tough time with the Mesoamerican Indians, right? So Our Lady goes there and everybody, by the millions, right? That's what she does. All she's doing is pointing at him. So I'm sitting there, what? And the bell system goes off. Well, that's when these, Our Lady appears. And I was just kind of sitting there praying, you know, because they stopped praying the rosary and everything got still. And I observed things and I'm like, it's really still. Like the birds aren't chirping. It's like dead silent. And these people were looking up at the sun. There were people that weren't, but most people were sitting there looking at the sun and I was like, I had heard of all these things. I didn't expect to see them. Same kind of stuff happened in Fatima, right? Looking up at the sun, I didn't have to turn away. Where's the optic fatigue? Where's the shit? No. Where, must be meteorological. We're going to have to ask the, meteor, the meteorologist, you know, what's the effect that allows that to happen? Well, there weren't enough clouds. That we, it, would, it would shoot beams of light off it. And it would turn colors. And it would spin one direction and stop, spin the other direction, or it might throb. And I'm like going, hey, lady, what do you see? And that's where I learned magenta. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we see the things we don't describe them the same. So I went to go see my mom to share this, right? And I walked around the back of the church where I didn't, I'd never been in it other than that morning. Certainly didn't have it memorized. And where the tabernacle was inside, I was on the outside and all of a sudden I was gone. And then I was shown my life. The bad stuff. Five-year-old kid steals a little miniature car and I feel how it breaks God's heart this little boy he loved so much gave to a family that could have easily bought that for me if I had asked for it and I stole it and I got to feel how that reverberated through the business you know and and you start losing your your trust and faith in your fellow man and woman right because it's what breaks it down and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And my reaction, I mean, total technicolor, right? Not like a movie over there, but like the whole thing. And then the, the ripple effect of how that hurt other people, the things you never think of. 
Like, if you, you know, you're a guy, you're being a guy thing in the worst way, and you tell some girl, you know, man, you're fat. I, I, I want a skinnier girlfriend than you. And she believes it. And it scores on her. And so now she starts making decisions after that that aren't good for her health, her, her mental well-being, the guys she chooses to be with. You see what I'm saying? All the kinds of stuff that we don't, we, we don't even think about that we're doing, you know, when we gossip at the proverbial water cooler and all that kind of stuff. But it was far worse than that. I mean, I will tell you and won't enumerate it, I broke every one of the Ten Commandments. And, and my reaction over and over was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't know. And every time there was the reminder, you chose to do that. And I was just, I think that when we are shown our life, right, when it's not God who judges us. We have already judged ourselves. We have already condemned ourselves, and we know where we belong. And it was my whole life. But then when it was over, I found I was on my knees. I was looking up at this miracle of the sun. And again, someone who doesn't cry a lot, doesn't cry well, and I have this snot problem, and I'm in short sleeves again. <laughs> so I'm like, I get up because my mom's sitting on a bench, you know, and I just do the, you know, it's not pretty. <laughs> and I, I went up. My mom, I could tell, could see this miracle of the sun, and I just put my arms around her, and we were like little kids. Because you're looking at the most powerful energy source known to man, and God can manipulate it at his will. He is not bound by the rules he made. He can show me my entire life in a fraction of a moment. You know, if he decides to heal your broken bone, the only thing that disappeared, miraculous, is time. It knit together what you would naturally normally do, except there was no time coordinate to it. And all the other kinds of things that we think are, right? Mary has told us if we pray, we can avert, avert wars. If we pray and fast, we can break the bondages that are in our families that have come down from our fathers and mothers. We can pray. And people will get well. Not just some specialized holy guy. It says you will do it. And these things in greater in my name so that the Father will be glorified therein. We are not impotent people who have to look for a special few. We are all sons and daughters of the Almighty King. Ordination conforms me to Christ in a special and unique way for a purpose, but God is not bound by the sacraments. He binds himself to it so that there's grace there, but he doesn't, grace abounds everywhere and at all times because he's there and wants to give it to us. You can, I can reject it and did, and you can reject it and your kids and your friends, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. That God isn't trying to knock at the door of our hearts and get our attention. So, I mean, I come out of this experience and I want to go to confession like real bad. Like, and the next day I go, I go down to the church and it was like this light raining. There was no place inside to go. A lot of that stuff's been built since. But, but I, I had met this, this priest um, who was like me now. He's, he's older vocation, in his 50s, and he was in Medjugorje, Irish priest, um, and I just knew he'd be my confessor. He'd understand. He wouldn't... He, I just knew he, he was the guy. And I was underneath an... Uh, no, I wasn't underneath an umbrella. I was standing there in a USA jacket, which will get you shot sometimes, and... and uh, uh, I said, I would have liked to go on a confession to Father Mike. And he walked right out of my peripheral vision. 
like just as soon as I, I didn't think of it as a prayer, but that's a prayer, right? It's just a thought, but out he walks. He's got an umbrella. We sit in a chair, and for two hours, he listens to my confession, and I would get to the dicey spots. Remember that? Like the woman in the confessional with me, kind of him and all around, because it's embarrassing. How could I ever have done that? And he would have the script, and this is what you were thinking. The gifts of the confessional that the priest gets to help the penitent. It's about the penitent. It's about them being able to voice the reality of their lives. For each one of us to be able to say, as difficult as it might be, God, I have offended you and offended your people. I have done this. Only to have God say, I forgive you. I absolve you of all the consequences of that. When his hands came over my head in absolution, this heat came out of his hands. And I didn't know what it was. I just knew that it was. My observant part of me, while it's happening, I record things. That's why I speak, I guess, because I record the event as it happens, almost third person, while it's happening to me. And, and he gave me a penance that was appropriate. I was to go to that holy mountain and take off my shoes. Because, not because it was a penance. That wasn't the penance. That was the equalizer. I was, I was 30 years old, right? Or I was 39, yeah, I was 31 at that point. I, that, that there were people who were old and infirm and, right, really sick. And this was just going to make a beginning level or ground. And I was to pray for everyone I ever hurt. Well, I was about 50 pounds heavier, and, I, and, and uh, I have these little size eight feet, and all my nerve endings are there. It's a brutal climb. And what's worse is I could remember the events, the things I had said, and I could remember people's names. Now, if you get to know me at all, you will find out that I cannot remember names. I, I, the bishop's name, I know it's a four-letter word, starts with C. I, I know he's devotee, I know he's Portuguese, I know he can sing really well. I get to remember all that stuff. Like when I was dating, if you didn't answer to honey or baby, I was in big trouble. <laughs> True, hand of God, serious. So, so smart people carry their shoes up with, or maybe whatever. I didn't have them with. Going down's harder because you can't control your footfall when you go down. And I cried, I sobbed all, the whole way. At that time, there was just this one crucifix standing at the bottom. And I went early in the morning so no one would see me. And I prostrated myself in front of the cross and I prayed for my life. I begged for it. I was like, I know I can do it perfect. From here on out, and I'll never make up for what I did. That's a bad, bad deal. And, and I got up from that, put on these shoes, and I thank God for Nike, because they saved my feet. <laughs> thank you, God. And, and then I went down to the church, and there was Father Mike, and he goes, come with me. And he, and he called it a healing service. He took out that folding purple stole, right? I, I, my, mine, I, I actually have a bigger one, and it, and it also doesn't get folds in it, you know, and I carry it with me, and I, I'm not going to get as uh, faded as it possibly can. I want war wounds on it, you know, fighting the evil one, the purple stole, and, and, he, and nothing happened to anybody else there, and I walk up, you know, I get about as close to the candle, and out of my mouth comes, I have many scars in my heart, and what I want is the Holy Spirit, and I'm like, that was weird, man, because I wasn't going to say nothing. You know, and I, was, I felt forgiven. I'm like, what was that about? And he goes, he goes I don't know if I'm going to be able to catch you. And I'm like, what? And he goes, he puts his hand on my head, and he puts his hand on my heart, and the Holy Spirit comes down, and I'm, in the awesome sense, scared. Those of you who know Star Trek, the original series, right? I, I think that's what it feels like when you stick your head into the antimatter. I mean, it was so powerful. It's so incredible. It was, it was any human experience I'd had didn't, didn't match it. 
And it was, it was so powerful, it frightened me. And he goes, <coughs> let there be no more doubt. Let there be no more fear. And it was like taking the biggest breath of air I ever took in my life. <gasps> and <coughs> the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I, it, I tell you, it's a real thing. And, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm blasted. And then the more I open myself up, the more he fills me. The more I open myself, the more he fills me until there wasn't a definition anymore. And I was back in that ecstasy thing where I don't care. I'm here. You know, don't leave me alone, right? I'm just happy in love. And I don't know how long it lasted, but all of a sudden, I kind of relaxed away from it. And here, Father Mike had his hand in my heart, and Bill Curry was on the other side, and I was flat on the floor. And my, my, my feet were sticking straight out like that, and I was stiff, right? I say, like, take two folding chairs, one under my head, one under my feet, bam, you know? And, and then, as my body relaxed, into it came this warmth and joy that was different than others' love and and fun events and all that kind of stuff. It was just joy. I'd never known true joy. And I got up, and Father Mike said I almost broke his back. I hugged him so hard, and I've never been the same. It cleared my conscience out. I'm sitting there filled with the Holy Spirit, and I love everybody. <laughs> I'm sappy, syrupy, love everybody. And, and I was emanating this heat so I could only wear a T-shirt. And, um, and, and then, I can't remember if it was the next day or it was a couple days, um, was coming the Feast of Corpus Christi, right? The body and blood of Jesus Christ, the institution of the Eucharist, all that. First communions were traditionally held there. And um, it was really close upon it because I knew nothing came in between. That night they had a, a procession of little kids. And then the next morning... I had one of those visitations again, like the hospital and other things that have happened to me. And in it, I was standing in a field. All of a sudden, I found myself standing in a field, and the hill dropped off that way, and it dropped off that way with a, with a fence, wooden, grade wooden fence poles. And then it was about eight inch grass, about this long, and it was the, the backside silver and the front side's that green, just as you get from spring, that pea green stuff you can't ever paint properly. You know what those color real spring? Maybe not in California, because you, you'd, you'd understand California gold. We call that dead around my part of the country. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but you know how when the wind blows through grass like that, how it looks like waves? And then up walks Jesus, just like you'd ever imagine him to look, right? There's a little book, a boy that I believe had an authentic near-death experience called God is for Real or God is Real. I think God is for Real. I think many people have seen it or read it. In it, he talks about that atheist gal that God took to heaven and she paints incredible. And that that's, that's the closest to it I've ever seen. Except Jesus was not wearing that color in the pictures. He had a white undermantle that was pilly, like, had little brown flecks in it, mostly cream, it was soft looking, and then the outer one was woven in small squares, more finely done. And without saying anything like words, he goes, I want you to become a priest. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding. And this is how I talk to God. I'm not, I don't, I don't go, and you, August Majesty. No, I'm like, you know, I'm the worst sinner ever. We, you just took me through this in technicolor. <laughs> and he goes, yeah. I'm like, I'm engaged to be married. The dress is bought. The country club is rented. I've done, you know, the marriage prep thing. I've named my kids. I've treated her like my wife before she was my wife, right? I never, 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 ever thought of being a priest. No, no, no. Uh, some fervor in a camping trip or something. Never. I was the guy that, you know, would smuggle the bottle on the confirmation hayride. <laughs> Guilty. He goes, yeah. I'm going, don't, this isn't for guys like me. This is for guys that, you know, you create them from all time. 
knowing that they're going to be priests. You put them into this wonderful family. They come up, the altar boy shoot, and then they're priests. <laughs> Isn't that how you were taught it? That's not kind of how I picked it up. And I'm like, it's not for guys like me. And he goes, I know what I'm doing. And he turns and walks away. And I was crushed. Absolutely crushed. Because no dream I ever had for myself included that. And what I knew of love, I was in love. What? I shake my mom awake, and she says, I can't help you. <laughs> I never thought that was funny, but <laughs> I guess it is. Um, and, and I went down to the church, and it was packed, you know. And I had, you got to remember, my hair's like this long. <laughs> I got a funky looking mustache on. And do you remember Zubas? The World Wrestling Federation, they're starting to kind of come back or something like that. They had all these, they were like pajama bottoms that were all wild and team colors and all that. I had on Atlanta Flames Zubas. <laughs> Why there wasn't somebody, including my mother, says, that is not a good wardrobe for you. Just not. They picked me to do the readings. <laughs> so I get up and I do the readings, which is normally picked from wherever. And, and I remember Mr. Chenier's um, uh, ninth grade speech class. I go up there, and from the waist up, I'm absolutely calm. Everything's coming out beautiful. From the waist down, my legs are like noodles behind, but you couldn't see them, right? The priest could, but... So I come outside, and I, I go, uh, Mom, wasn't that really cool that uh, I did the reading? She goes, I was behind a pillar. That wasn't your voice. Every priest walked out of that rectory, walked uh, door or sacristy door walked up to me and said, are you a priest? And I'd be going, no, you know. If I was an English-speaking priest, I'd have been there with y'all, you know. And they'd go, we need you, and walked away. Everyone, exact same thing. Tom, you know, I don't know how many guys, I, I say 37, because that, that's the number I remember, but every priest came out and said the same thing to me. And every time I get really, really, really down, some person will come up to me and say, you know, don't give up. We really need you. I went home, and my fiance is waiting for us. She goes, welcome home, honey. And, and I know what that means. And I'm like, I'm really tired. I need to go home. <laughs> so I went to Mass with me, my mom, and my fiance. And we're in the, the, the uh, Fleet and Farm store, right? And this guy's in front of us, and he eventually joined a religious order, and he turns around and he goes, so when are you going to talk to the bishop about being a priest? And her head goes, <laughs> <laughs> it was a long ride home. But the thing is, is that because God has powerfully called me in that way, I've been able to really withstand a lot of abuse, right? It's not easy this way. You, when the view from the pew is it's an easy thing in the seminary. It is not. The biggest obstacle for men and women to pursue a religious vocation is their parents don't want it. My mother had to give up those grandbabies that I would love to have given her. That wasn't going to be, but she gave the church and Jesus Christ a priest's son. And hopefully, right, like I told one penitent, if I, if I came here just for you, just one person, that they would be blessed. In some way, there is not a greater thing that I could do. And for where it came from, that is divine mercy. That is grace upon grace. Unmerited favor from God. Nothing I have ever done or ever will do merits the grace that He has shown me. And I have hundreds of other stories. I am just another witness. God is real. God is real. You are not an accident. You are intentioned by Almighty God and absolutely unique, and He loves you so much, all He wants Him back is your unique love in return. That's it. That's the gospel. Love the Lord your God with all of your mind, with all of your heart, with all of your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
I give you but one commandment, love one another as I have loved you. That's it. If we get that right, we know where we're going. And if you're not right, you can get your butt in the penalty box and get right. <laughs> Fatima is about that. Medjugorje is about the confessional. And I love being in the confessional. I'm not kidding. I really do. So this is a grace. And, and I find that I'm built for the confessional, um, that the Lord has allowed me to be able to assist penitents, letting me know what the sin is so that we can coax them to be able to voice that out loud and to release that maybe even the most unforgivable sin in their eyes to the mercy of Almighty God. I'm not revealing anything from confession that would break the seal. A woman came in and she entered the confession with me and, Father, you're going to have to help me. It's been a long time. And I said, well, it's so good you're here. You know, I'm surely willing to help you because God's grace has to be super abundant in your life for you to find your way here and to the confessional in these times. She was a bit vague. Um, and so I Knowing what it was, I, I, I said, you know, can you name that? Can you say what that sin is? Father, I had an abortion. And then we stand on holy ground. I let people know there's a, there's a box of tissues on this side, too. See, it's the screen. It's an omnity. And, and there's a goodness in that, Right? But I'm never doing confession at arm's length. I'm there in a place where God's abundant, super abundant, supernatural mercy worked that this woman carrying this, the seemingly unforgivable sin of murder of the innocent, was not beyond the grace and mercy of Almighty God, but rather his desire to bring his daughter. And I said, as I say to many women who have unfortunately been in that place where somehow they thought there was no other option. Please, God, let us help them. And that, you know, you're going to meet your son or daughter in heaven, and you're going to do that without shame. And your child is going to be so happy to see their mom. So I went from there and, and thanking God and, and blessing God for those wonderful moments where it affirms me in being a priest, in the, in the things that are singularly incredible, to be able to say, I absolve you, and to hold God in my hands. These are acts of divine mercy, of God's love for us, that he conquered sin and death so that we might have the freedom and the sons and daughters of Almighty God. And nothing, literally nothing, can keep us from that love if we are but willing to be humble enough to say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then we will know that love, that forgiveness. And we will be even able to forgive ourselves. God loves you, and he wants you to be happy. God loves you. He wants you to be happy. Not morose, not sad. He wants you to be happy. Love him back, and love the ones you are called to love. May Almighty God bless you all, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.